Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte. Chapter Twelve. The promise of a smooth career, which my first calm introduction to Thornfield Hall seemed to pledge, was not belied on a longer acquaintance with the place and its inmates. Mrs. Fairfax turned out to be what she appeared a placid tempered, kind natured woman, of competent education and average intelligence. My pupil was a lively child, who had been spoilt and indulged, and therefore was sometimes wayward, but as she was committed entirely to my care, and no injudicious interference from any quarter ever thwarted my plans for her improvement, she soon forgot her little freaks, and became obedient and teachable. She had no great talents, no marked traits of character, no peculiar development of feeling or taste which raised her one inch above the ordinary level of childhood, but neither had she any deficiency or vice which sunk her below it. She made reasonable progress, entertained for me a vivacious, though perhaps not very profound, affection, and by her simplicity, gay prattle, and efforts to please, inspired me, in return, with a degree of attachment sufficient to make us both content in each other's society. This, par parenthèse, will be thought cool language by persons who entertain solemn doctrines about the angelic nature of children, and the duty of those charged with their education to conceive for them an idolatrous devotion. But I am not writing to flatter parental egotism, to echo cant, or prop up humbug. I am merely telling the truth. I felt a conscientious solicitude for Adèle's welfare and progress, and a quiet liking for her little self, just as I cherished towards Mrs. Fairfax a thankfulness for her kindness, and a pleasure in her society proportionate to the tranquil regard she had for me, and the moderation of her mind and character. Anybody may blame me who likes, when I add further, that, now and then, when I took a walk by myself in the grounds, when I went down to the gates and looked through them along the road, or when, while Adèle played with her nurse, and Mrs. Fairfax made jellies in the store-room, I climbed the three staircases, raised the trap-door of the attic, and having reached the leads, looked out afar over sequestered field and hill and along dim sky-line that then I longed for a power of vision which might overpass that limit, which might reach the busy world, towns, regions full of life I had heard of but never seen, that then I desired more of practical experience than I possessed, more of intercourse with my kind, of acquaintance with variety of character, than was here within my reach. I valued what was good in Mrs. Fairfax, and what was good in Adèle but I believed in the existence of other and more vivid kinds of goodness, and what I believed in I wished to behold. Who blames me? Many, no doubt, and I shall be called discontented. I could not help it. The restlessness was in my nature. It agitated me to pain sometimes. Then my sole relief was to walk along the corridor of the third story, backwards and forwards, safe in the silence and solitude of the spot, and allow my mind's eye to dwell on whatever bright visions rose before it, and certainly they were many and glowing, to let my heart be heaved by the exultant movement, which, while it swelled it in trouble, expanded it with life, and best of all, to open my inward ear to a tale that was never ended, a tale my imagination created, and narrated continuously, quickened with all of incident, life, fire, feeling, that I desired and had not in my actual existence. It is in vain to say human beings ought to be satisfied with tranquillity. They must have action, and they will make it if they cannot find it. Millions are condemned to a stiller doom than mine, and millions are in silent revolt against their lot. Nobody knows how many rebellions, besides political rebellions, ferment in the masses of life which people earth. Women are supposed to be very calm, generally. But women feel just as men feel. They need exercise for their faculties, and a field for their efforts, as much as their brothers do. They suffer from too rigid a restraint, too absolute a stagnation, precisely as men would suffer. And it is narrow-minded in their more privileged fellow-creatures, to say that they ought to confine themselves to making puddings and knitting stockings, to playing on the piano and embroidering bags. It is thoughtless to condemn them, 
or laugh at them, if they seek to do more or learn more than custom has pronounced necessary for their sex. When thus alone, I not unfrequently heard Grace Poole's laugh, the same peal, the same low, slow, ha, ha, which, when first heard, had thrilled me. I heard, too, her eccentric murmurs, stranger than her laugh. There were days when she was quite silent, but there were others when I could not account for the sounds she made. Sometimes I saw her. She would come out of her room with a basin, or a plate, or a tray in her hand, go down to the kitchen, and shortly return, generally—O oh, romantic reader, forgive me for telling the plain truth—bearing a pot of porter. Her appearance always acted as a damper to the curiosity raised by her oral oddities. Hard-featured and staid, she had no point to which interest could attach. I made some attempts to draw her into conversation, but she seemed a person of few words. A monosyllabic reply usually cut short every effort of that sort. The other members of the household, viz. John and his wife, Leah the housemaid, and Sophie the French nurse, were decent people, but in no respect remarkable. With Sophie I used to talk French, and sometimes I asked her questions about her native country, but she was not of a descriptive or narrative turn and generally gave such vapid and confused answers, as were calculated rather to check than encourage inquiry. October, November, December passed away. One afternoon in January, Mrs. Fairfax had begged a holiday for Adele because she had a cold, and as Adele seconded the request with an ardour that reminded me how precious occasional holidays had been to me in my own childhood, I accorded it, deeming that I did well in showing pliability on the point. It was a fine, calm day, though very cold. I was tired of sitting still in the library, through a whole long morning. Mrs. Fairfax had just written a letter which was waiting to be posted, so I put on my bonnet and cloak, and volunteered to carry it to Hay. The distance, two miles, would be a pleasant winter afternoon walk. Having seen Adele comfortably seated in her little chair by Mrs. Fairfax's parlour fireside, and given her best wax doll, which I usually kept enveloped in a silver paper in a drawer, to play with, and a story-book for change of amusement, and having replied to her, Revenez bientôt, mon bon ami, ma chère mademoiselle Jeannette, with a kiss, I set out. The ground was hard, the air was still, my road was lonely. I walked fast till I got warm, and then I walked slowly to enjoy and analyse the species of pleasure brooding for me in the hour and situation. It was three o'clock. The church bell tolled as I passed under the belfry. The charm of the hour lay in its approaching dimness, in the low gliding and pale beaming sun. I was a mile from Thornfield, in a lane noted for wild roses in summer, for nuts and blackberries in autumn and even now possessing a few coral treasures and hips and halls, but whose best winter delight lay in its utter solitude and leafless repose. If a breath of air stirred, it made no sound here, for there was not a holly, not an evergreen to rustle, and the stripped hawthorn and hazel bushes were as still as the white, worn stones which causewayed the middle of the path. Far and wide on each side there were only fields, where no cattle now browsed and the little brown birds, which stirred occasionally in the hedge, looked like single russet leaves that had forgotten to drop. This lane inclined uphill all the way to Hay. Having reached the middle, I sat down on a stile which led thence into a field. Gathering my mantle about me, and sheltering my hands in my muff, I did not feel the cold, though it froze keenly, as was attested by a sheet of ice covering the causeway where a little brooklet, now congealed, had overflowed after a rapid thaw some days since. From my seat I could look down on Thornfield. The grey and battlemented hall was the principal object in the vale below me. Its woods and dark rookery rose against the west. I lingered till the sun went down amongst the trees, and sank crimson and clear behind them. I then turned eastward. On the hilltop above me sat the rising moon. Pale yet as a cloud, but brightening momentarily, she looked over hay, which, half lost in trees, sent up a blue smoke from its few chimneys. It was yet a mile distant, but in the absolute hush I could hear plainly its thin murmurs of life. My ear, too, felt the flow of currents. In what dales and depths I could not tell, but there were many hills beyond hay, and doubtless many becks threading their passes. 
That evening calm betrayed alike the tinkle of the nearest streams, the sue of the most remote. A rude noise broke on these fine ripplings and whisperings, at once so far away and so clear. A positive tramp, tramp, a metallic clatter, which effaced the soft wave wanderings, as, in a picture, the solid mass of a crag, or the rough boles of a great oak, drawn in dark and strong on the foreground, efface the aerial distance of Asia Hill, sunny horizon, and blended clouds, where tint melts into tint. The din was on the causeway. A horse was coming. The windings of the lane yet hid it, but it approached. I was just leaving the stile, yet, as the path was narrow, I sat still to let it go by. In those days I was young and all sorts of fancies, bright and dark, tenanted my mind. The memories of nursery stories were there amongst other rubbish, and when they recurred, maturing youth added to them a vigour and vividness beyond what childhood could give. As this horse approached, and as I watched for it to appear through the dusk, I remembered certain of Bessie's tales, wherein figured a North of England spirit called a guy-trash, which, in the form of a horse, mule, or large dog, haunted solitary ways, and sometimes came upon belated travellers, as this horse was now coming upon me. It was very near, but not yet in sight, when, in addition to the tramp, tramp, I heard a rush under the hedge, and close down by the hazel stems glided a great dog, whose black and white colour made him a distinct object against the trees. It was exactly one form of Bessie's guy-trash, a lion-like creature with long hair and a huge head. It passed me, however, quietly enough, not staying to look up with strange pretocanine eyes in my face, as I half expected it would. The horse followed, a tall steed, and on its back a rider. The man, the human being, broke the spell at once. Nothing ever rode the guy-trash. It was always alone and goblins, to my notions, though they might tenant the dumb carcasses of beasts, could scarce covet shelter in the commonplace human form. No guy-trash was this, only a traveller taking the short-cut to milk it. He passed, and I went on. A few steps, and I turned, a sliding sound and an exclamation of, "'What the deuce is to do now?' and a clattering tumble arrested my attention. Man and horse were down. They had slipped on the sheet of ice which glazed the causeway. The dog came bounding back, and seeing his master in a predicament, and hearing the horse groan, barked till the evening hills echoed the sound, which was deep in proportion to his magnitude. He snuffed round the prostrate group, and then he ran up to me. It was all he could do. There was no other help at hand to summon. I obeyed him, and walked down to the traveller, by this time struggling himself free of his steed. His efforts were so vigorous, I thought he could not be much hurt, but I asked him the question. "'Are you injured, sir?' I think he was swearing, but I am not certain. However, he was pronouncing some formula which prevented him from replying to me directly. "'Can I do anything?' I asked again. "'You must just stand on one side,' he answered as he rose first to his knees, and then to his feet. I did, whereupon began a heaving, stamping, clattering process, accompanied by a barking and baying which removed me effectually some yards' distance, but I would not be driven quite away till I saw the event. This was finally fortunate. The horse was re-established, and the dog was silenced with a, "'Down, pilot!' The traveller, now stooping, felt his foot and leg as if trying whether they were sound. Apparently something ailed them for he halted to the stile whence I had just risen, and sat down. I was in the mood for being useful, or at least officious, I think, for I now drew near him again. "'If you are hurt, and want help, sir, I can fetch some one either from Thornfield Hall or from Hay.' "'Thank you. I shall do. I have no broken bones, only a sprain.' And again he stood up and tried his foot, but the result extorted an involuntary, "'Ugh!' Oh! Something of daylight still lingered and the moon was waxing bright, I could see him plainly. His figure was enveloped in a riding-cloak, fur-collared and steel-clasped. Its details were not apparent, but I traced the general points of middle height and considerable breadth of chest. He had a dark face, with stern features and a heavy brow. His eyes and gathered eyebrows looked ireful and thwarted just now. He was past youth, but had not reached middle age. Perhaps he might be thirty-five. I felt no fear of him, and but little shyness. 
Had he been a handsome, heroic-looking young gentleman, I should not have dared to stand thus questioning him against his will, and offering my services unasked. I had hardly ever seen a handsome youth, never in my life spoken to one. I had a theoretical reverence and homage for beauty, elegance, gallantry, fascination. But had I met those qualities incarnate in masculine shape, I should have known instinctively that they neither had nor could have sympathy with anything in me, and should have shunned them as one would fire, lightning, or anything else that is bright but antipathetic. If even the stranger had smiled and been good-humoured to me when I addressed him, if he had put off my offer with assistance gaily and with thanks, I should have gone on my way and not felt any vacation to renew inquiries. But the frown, the roughness of the traveller, set me at my ease. I retained my station when he waved me to go, and announced, "'I cannot think of leaving you, sir, at so late an hour in this solitary lane, till I see you are fit to mount your horse.' He looked at me when I said this. He had hardly turned his eyes in my direction before. "'I should think you ought to be at home yourself,' said he. "'If you have a home in this neighbourhood, where do you come from?' from just below, and I am not at all afraid of being out late when it is moonlight. I will run over to Hay for you with pleasure, if you wish it. Indeed, I am going there to post a letter." "'You live just below. Do you mean at that house with the battlements?' pointing to Thornfield Hall, on which the moon cast a hoary gleam, bringing it out distinct and pale from the woods, that, by contrast with the western sky, now seemed one mass of shadow. "'Yes, sir. Whose house is it? Mr. Rochester's. Do you know Mr. Rochester? No, I have never seen him. He is not resident, then? No. Can you tell me where he is? I cannot. You are not a servant at the hall, of course. You are— He stopped, ran his eye over my dress, which, as usual, was quite simple a black merino cloak, a black beaver bonnet, neither of them half fine enough for a lady's maid. He seemed puzzled to decide what I was. I helped him. I am the governess. Ah, the governess, he repeated. Deuce take me if I had not forgotten. The governess! And again my raiment underwent scrutiny. In two minutes he rose from the stile. His face expressed pain when he tried to move. I cannot commission you to fetch help he said. But you may help me a little yourself, if you will be so kind." "'Yes, sir." "'You have not an umbrella that I can use as a stick?" "'No." "'Try to get hold of my horse's bridle, and lead him to me. You are not afraid?" I should have been afraid to touch a horse when alone, but when told to do it, I was disposed to obey. I put down my muff on the stile, and went up to the tall steed. I endeavoured to catch the bridle but it was a spirited thing, and would not let me come near its head. I made effort on effort, though in vain. Meantime I was mortally afraid of its trampling forefeet. The traveller waited and watched for some time, and at last he laughed. "'I see,' he said. "'The mountain will never be brought to Mahomet, so all you can do is to aid Mahomet to go to the mountain. I must beg of you to come here.' I came. "'Excuse me,' he continued. Necessity compels me to make you useful." He laid a heavy hand on my shoulder, and leaning on me with some stress, limped to his horse. Having once caught the bridle, he mastered it directly and sprang to his saddle, grimacing grimly as he made the effort, for it wrenched his sprain. "'Now,' said he, releasing his under-lip from a hard bite, "'just hand me my whip. It lies there under the hedge.' I sought it, and found it. "'Thank you. Now make haste with a letter to Hay, and return as fast as you can." A touch of a spurred heel made his horse first start and rear, and then bound away. The dog rushed in his traces. All three vanished. Like heath, that in the wilderness, the wild wind whirls away. I took up my muff and walked on. The incident had occurred and was gone for me. It was an incident of no moment, no romance, no interest in a sense. Yet it marked with change one single hour of a monotonous life. My help had been needed and claimed. I had given it. I was pleased to have done something. Trivial, transitory though the deed was, it was yet an active thing, and I was weary of an existence all passive. 
The new face, too, was like a new picture introduced to the gallery of memory, and it was dissimilar to all the others hanging there, firstly because it was masculine, and secondly because it was dark, strong, and stern. I had it still before me when I entered Hay, and slipped the letter into the post-office. I saw it as I walked fast downhill all the way home. When I came to the stile, I stopped a minute, looked round and listened, with an idea that a horse's hoofs might ring on the causeway again, and that a rider in a cloak, and a guy-trash like Newfoundland dog, might be again apparent. I saw only the hedge and a pollard willow before me, rising up still and straight to meet the moonbeams. I heard only the faintest waft of wind roaming fitful among the trees round Thornfield a mile distant and when I glanced down in the direction of the murmur, my eye, traversing the hall-front, caught a light kindling in a window. It reminded me that I was late, and I hurried on. I did not like re-entering Thornfield. To pass its threshold was to return to stagnation, to cross the silent hall, to ascend the darksome staircase, to seek my own lonely little room, and then to meet tranquil Mrs. Fairfax, and spend the long winter evening with her, and her only, was to quell wholly the faint excitement wakened by my walk, to slip again over my faculties the viewless fetters of a uniform and too still existence, of an existence whose very privileges of security and ease I was becoming incapable of appreciating. What good it would have done me at that time to have been tossed in the storms of an uncertain, struggling life, and to have been taught by rough and bitter experience to long for the calm amidst which I now repined! Yes, just as much good as it would do a man tired of sitting still, in a too easy chair, to take a long walk, and just as natural was the wish to stir, under my circumstances, as it would be under his. I lingered at the gates. I lingered on the lawn. I paced backwards and forwards on the pavement. The shutters of the glass door were closed. I could not see into the interior, and both my eyes and spirit seemed drawn from the gloomy house, from the grey hollow filled with rayless cells, as it appeared to me, to that sky expanded before me, a blue sea absolved from taint of cloud, the moon ascending it in solemn march, her orb seeming to look up as she left the hill-tops from behind which she had come, far and farther below her, and aspired to the zenith, midnight dark in its fathomless depth and measureless distance, and for those trembling stars that followed her course, they made my heart tremble, my veins glow when I viewed them. Little things recall us to earth. The clock struck in the hall. That sufficed. I turned from moon and stars, opened a side door, and went in. The hall was not dark, nor yet was it lit, only by the high-hung bronze lamp. A warm glow suffused both it and the lower steps of the oak staircase. This ruddy shine issued from the great dining-room, whose two-leaved door stood open, and showed a genial fire in the grate, glancing on marble hearth and brass fire-irons, and revealing purple draperies and polished furniture, in the most pleasant radiance. It revealed, too, a group near the mantelpiece. I had scarcely caught it, and scarcely become aware of a cheerful mingling of voices, amongst which I seemed to distinguish the tones of Adèle, when the door closed. I hastened to Mrs. Fairfax's room. There was a fire there, too, but no candle, and no Mrs. Fairfax. Instead, all alone, sitting upright on the rug, and gazing with gravity at the blaze, I beheld a great black-and-white long-haired dog, just like the guy trash of the lane. It was so like it that I went forward and said, Pilot? And the thing got up and came to me and snuffed me. I caressed him, and he wagged his great tail. But he looked an eerie creature to be alone with, and I could not tell whence he had come. I rang the bell, for I wanted a candle, and I wanted, too, to get an account of this visitant. Leah entered. What dog is this? He came with Master. With whom? With Master, Mr. Rochester. He's just arrived. Indeed. And is Mrs. Fairfax with him? Yes, and Miss Adele. They are in the dining-room, as John has gone for a surgeon, for Master has had an accident. His horse fell and his ankle is sprained. Did the horse fall in Hay Lane? Yes, coming down hill. It slipped on some ice. Ah! Bring me a candle, will you, Leah? Leah brought it. 
She entered, followed by Mrs. Fairfax, who repeated the news, adding that Mr. Carter the surgeon was come, and was now with Mr. Rochester. Then she hurried out to give orders about tea, and I went upstairs to take off my things. End of chapter 12 Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte Chapter 13 Mr. Rochester, it seems, by the surgeon's orders, went to bed early that night, nor did he rise soon next morning. When he did come down, it was to attend to business, his agent and some of his tenants were arrived and waiting to speak with him. Adèle and I had now to vacate the library, it would be in daily requisition as a reception-room for callers. A fire was lit in an apartment upstairs, and there I carried our books, and arranged it for the future schoolroom. I discerned in the course of the morning that Thornfield Hall was a changed place. No longer silent as a church, it echoed every hour or two to a knock at the door, or a clang of the bell. Steps, too, often traversed the hall, and new voices spoke in different keys below. A rill from the outer world was flowing through it. It had a master. For my part, I liked it better. Adèle was not easy to teach that day. She could not apply. She kept running to the door and looking over the banisters to see if she could get a glimpse of Mr. Rochester. Then she coined pretexts to go downstairs, in order, as I shrewdly suspected, to visit the library, where I knew she was not wanted. Then, when I got a little angry, and made her sit still, she continued to talk incessantly of her ami Monsieur Edward Fairfax de Rochester, as she dubbed him. I had not before heard his praenomens, and to conjecture what presents he had brought her. For it appears he had intimated the night before, that when his luggage came from Milcote, there would be found amongst it a little box in whose contents she had an interest. "'Et cela doit signifier,' said she, "'qu'il y aura la dedans un cadeau pour moi, et peut-être pour vous aussi, mademoiselle. Monsieur a parlé de vous, il m'a demandé le nom de ma gouvernante, et si elle n'était pas un petit person. Ah, c'est mince, est un peu pâle. J'ai dit que oui, car c'est vrai, n'est-ce pas, mademoiselle? I and my pupil dined as usual in Mrs. Fairfax's parlour. The afternoon was wild and snowy, and we passed it in the schoolroom. At dark I allowed Adèle to put away books and work, and to run downstairs, for, from the comparative silence below, and from the cessation of appeals to the door-bell, I conjectured that Mr. Rochester was now at liberty. Left alone, I walked to the window but nothing was to be seen thence. Twilight and snowflakes together thickened the air, and hid the very shrubs on the lawn. I let down the curtain, and went back to the fireside. In the clear embers I was tracing a view, not unlike a picture I remembered to have seen of the castle of Heidelberg on the Rhine, when Mrs. Fairfax came in, breaking up by her entrance the fiery mosaic I had been piercing together, and scattering, too, some heavy unwelcome thoughts that were beginning to throng on my solitude. "'Mr. Rochester would be glad if you and your pupil would take tea with him in the drawing-room this evening,' said she. "'He has been so much engaged all day that he could not ask to see you before.' "'When is his tea-time?' I inquired. "'Oh, at six o'clock. He keeps early hours in the country. You had better change your frock now. I will go with you and fasten it. Here is a candle.' "'Is it necessary to change my frock?' "'Yes, you had better. I always dress for the evening when Mr. Rochester is here.' This additional ceremony seemed somewhat stately. However, I repaired to my room, and, with Mrs. Fairfax's aid, replaced my black stuffed dress by one of black silk, the best and the only additional one I had, except one of light grey, which, in my lowwood notions of the toilet, I thought too fine to be worn, except on first-rate occasions. "'You want a brooch,' said Mrs. Fairfax. I had a single little pearl ornament which Miss Temple gave me as a parting keepsake. I put it on, and then we went downstairs. Unused as I was to strangers, it was rather a trial to appear thus formally summoned in Mr. Rochester's presence. I let Mrs. Fairfax precede me into the dining-room, and kept in her shade as we crossed that apartment, and passing the arch, whose curtain was now dropped, entered the elegant recess beyond. Two wax candles stood lighted on the table, and two on the mantelpiece. Basking in the light and heat of a superb fire lay Pilot. Adèle knelt near him. Half reclined on a couch appeared Mr. Rochester, his foot supported by the cushion. He was looking at Adèle and the dog. The fire shone full on his face. 
I knew my traveller, with his broad and jetty eyebrows, his square forehead, made squarer by the horizontal sweep of his black hair. I recognised his decisive nose, more remarkable for character than beauty, his full nostrils, denoting, I thought, collar, his grim mouth, chin, and jaw. Yes, all three were very grim, and no mistake. His shape, now divested of cloak, I perceived harmonised in squareness with his physiognomy. I suppose it was a good figure, in the athletic sense of the term, broad-chested and thin-flanked, though neither tall nor graceful. Mr. Rochester must have been aware of the entrance of Mrs. Fairfax and myself, but it appeared he was not in the mood to notice us, for he never lifted his head as we approached. "'Here is Miss Eyre, sir,' said Mrs. Fairfax, in her quiet way. He bowed, still not taking his eyes from the group of the dog and child. "'Let Miss Eyre be seated,' said he, and there was something in the forced, stiff bow, in the impatient yet formal tone, which seemed further to express, "'What the deuce is it to me whether Miss Eyre is there or not? At this moment I am not disposed to accost her.' I sat down, quite disembarrassed. A reception of finished politeness would probably have confused me. I could not have returned or repaid it by answering grace and elegance on my part. But harsh caprice laid me under no obligation. On the contrary, a decent quiescence, under the freak of manner, gave me the advantage. Besides, the eccentricity of the proceeding was piquant. I felt interested to see how he would go on. He went on as a statue would. That is, he neither spoke nor moved. Mrs. Fairfax seemed to think it necessary that some one should be amiable, and she began to talk. Kindly, as usual, and, as usual, rather trite, she condoled with him on the pressure of business he had had all day, on the annoyance it must have been to him with that painful sprain, then she commended his patience and perseverance in going through with it. "'Madam, I should like some tea,' was the sole rejoinder she got. She hastened to ring the bell and when the tray came, she proceeded to arrange the cups, spoons, etc., with assiduous celerity. I and Adele went to the table, but the master did not leave his couch. "'Will you hand Mr. Rochester's cup?' said Mrs. Fairfax to me. "'Adele might perhaps spill it.' I did as requested. As he took the cup from my hand, Adele, thinking the moment propitious for making a request in my favour, cried out, N'est-ce pas, monsieur, qu'il y a un cadeau pour Mademoiselle Eyre dans votre petite coffre? Who talks of cadeau? said he gruffly. Did you expect a present, Miss Eyre? Are you fond of presents? And he searched my face with eyes that I saw were dark, irate, and piercing. I hardly know, sir. I have little experience of them. They are generally thought pleasant things. Generally thought? But what do you think? I should be obliged to take time, sir, before I could give you an answer worthy of your acceptance. A present has many faces to it, has it not? And one should consider all before pronouncing an opinion as to its nature." "'Miss Eyre, you are not so unsophisticated as Adèle. She demands a cadeau clamorously the moment she sees me. You beat about the bush." "'Because I have less confidence in my deserts than Adèle has. She can prefer the claim of old acquaintance, and the right too of custom. For she says you have always been in the habit of giving her playthings. But if I had to make out a case, I should be puzzled, since I am a stranger, and have done nothing to entitle me to an acknowledgment. Oh, don't fall back on over-modesty! I have examined Adèle, and find you have taken great pains with her. She is not bright, she has no talents, yet in a short time she has made much improvement. Sir, you have now given me my cadeau. I am obliged to you. It is the mead teachers most covet, praise of their pupils' progress." Humph," said Mr. Rochester, and he took his tea in silence. "'Come to the fire,' said the master, when the tray was taken away, and Mrs. Fairfax had settled into a corner with her knitting, while Adèle was leading me by the hand round the room, showing me the beautiful books and ornaments on the consoles and chiffonniere. We obeyed as in duty bound. Adèle wanted to take a seat on my knee, but she was ordered to amuse herself with Pilot. "'You have been resident in my house three months?' "'Yes, sir.' "'And you came from—' "'From Lowood School, in Blankshire.' "'Ah! A charitable concern! How long were you there?' Eight years.' Eight years! You must be tenacious of life. I thought half the time in such a place would have done up any constitution.' 
No wonder you have rather the look of another world. I marvelled where you had got that sort of face. When you came on me in Hay Lane last night, I thought unaccountably of fairy tales, and had half a mind to demand whether you had bewitched my horse. I am not sure yet. Who are your parents? I have none. Nor ever had, I suppose. Do you remember them? No. I thought not. And so you were waiting for your people when you sat on that stile? For whom, sir? For the men in green. It was a proper moonlight evening for them. Did I break through one of your rings that you spread that damned ice on the causeway?" I shook my head. The men in green all forsook England a hundred years ago, said I, speaking as seriously as he had done. And not even in Hay Lane, or the fields about it, could you find a trace of them. I don't think either summer or harvest, or winter moon will ever shine on their revels more." Mrs. Fairfax had dropped her knitting, and, with raised eyebrows, seemed wondering what sort of talk this was. "'Well,' resumed Mr. Rochester, "'if you disown parents, you must have some sort of kinsfolk—uncles and aunts?' "'No, none that I ever saw.' "'And your home?' "'I have none.' "'Where do your brothers and sisters live?' I have no brothers or sisters. Who recommended you to come here? I advertised, and Mrs. Fairfax answered my advertisement. Yes, said the good lady, who now knew what ground we were upon. And I am daily thankful for the choice Providence led me to make. Miss Eyre has been an invaluable companion to me, and a kind and careful teacher to Adele. Don't trouble yourself to give her a character, returned Mr. Rochester. Eulogiums will not bias me, I shall judge for myself. She began by felling my horse." "'Sir,' said Mrs. Fairfax, "'I have her to thank for this sprain." The widow looked bewildered. "'Miss Eyre, have you ever lived in a town?' "'No, sir.' "'Have you seen much society?' "'None but the pupils and teachers of Lowood, and now the inmates of Thornfield.' "'Have you read much?' Only such books as came in my way, and they have not been numerous or very learned. You have lived the life of a nun. No doubt you are well drilled in religious forms. Brocklehurst, who I understand directs Lowood as a parson, is he not? Yes, sir. And you girls probably worshipped him, as a convent full of religieuses would worship their director. Oh, no. You are very cool. No. What? A novice not worship a priest? That sounds blasphemous." I disliked Mr. Brocklehurst, and I was not alone in the feeling. He is a harsh man, at once pompous and meddling. He cut off our hair, and for economy's sake brought us bad needles and thread, with which we could hardly sew. "'That was very false economy,' remarked Mrs. Fairfax, who now again caught the drift of the dialogue. "'And what was the head and front of his offending?' demanded Mr. Rochester. He starved us when he had the sole superintendence of the provision department, before the committee was appointed, and he bored us with long lectures once a week, and with evening readings from books of his own indicting, about sudden deaths and judgments, which made us afraid to go to bed. What age were you when you went to Lowood? About ten. And you stayed there eight years. You are now, then, eighteen? I assented. Arithmetic, you see, is useful. Without its aid, I should hardly have been able to guess your age. It is a point difficult to fix where the features and countenance are so much at variance as in your case. And now what did you learn at Lowood? Can you play?" A little? Of course. That is the established answer. Go into the library. I mean, if you please. Excuse my tone of command. I am used to say, do this, and it is done. I cannot alter my customary habits for this one new inmate. Go then into the library, take a candle with you, leave the door open, sit down to the piano, and play a tune." I departed, obeying his directions. "'Enough!' he called out in a few minutes. "'You play a little, I see, like any other English schoolgirl. Perhaps rather better than some, but not well.' I closed the piano and returned. Mr. Rochester continued. Adele showed me some sketches this morning, which she said were yours. I don't know whether they were entirely of your doing. Probably a master aided you." "'No, indeed,' I interjected. 
Ah, that pricks pride. Well, fetch me your portfolio, if you can vouch for its contents being original. But don't pass your word unless you are certain. I can recognise patchwork." Then I shall say nothing, and you shall judge for yourself, sir. I brought the portfolio from the library. Approach the table, said he, and I wheeled it to his couch. Adèle and Mrs. Fairfax drew near to see the pictures. No crowding, said Mr. Rochester. Take the drawings from my hand as I finish with them, but don't push your faces up to mine. He deliberately scrutinized each sketch and painting. Three he laid aside. The others, when he examined them, he swept from him. Take them off to the other table, Mrs. Fairfax, said he, and look at them with Adèle. You, glancing at me, resume your seat and answer my questions. I perceive those pictures were done by one hand. Was that hand yours? Yes. And when did you find time to do them? They have taken much time, and some thought. I did them in the last two vacations I spent at Lowood, when I had no other occupation. Where did you get your copies? Out of my head. That head I see now on your shoulders. Yes, sir. Has it other furniture of the same kind within? I should think it may have. I should hope, better. He spread the pictures before him, and again surveyed them alternately. While he is so occupied, I will tell you, reader, what they are, and first I must premise that they are nothing wonderful. The subjects had, indeed, risen vividly on my mind. As I saw them with the spiritual eye before I attempted to embody them, they were striking, but my hand would not second my fancy, and in each case it had brought out but a pale portrait of the thing I had conceived. These pictures were in water-colours. The first represented clouds, low and livid, rolling over a swollen sea. All the distance was an eclipse. So, too, was the foreground, or rather the nearest billows, for there was no land. One gleam of light lifted into relief a half-submerged mast, on which sat a cormorant, dark and large, with wings flecked with foam. Its beak held a gold bracelet set with gems, that I had touched with as brilliant tints as my palette could yield, and as glittering distinctness as my pencil could impart. Sinking below the bird and mast, a drowned corpse glanced through the green water. A fair arm was the only limb clearly visible, whence the bracelet had been washed or torn. The second picture contained for foreground only the dim peak of a hill, with grass and some leaves slanting as if by a breeze. Beyond and above spread an expanse of sky, dark blue as at twilight. Rising into the sky was a woman's shape to the bust, portrayed in tints as dusk and soft as I could combine. The dim forehead was crowned with a star. The lineaments below were seen as through the suffusion of vapour. The eyes shone dark and wild, the hair streamed shadowy like a beamless cloud torn by storm or electric travail. On the neck lay a pale reflection like moonlight. The same faint lustre touched the train of thin clouds from which rose and bowed this vision of the evening star. The third showed the pinnacle of an iceberg piercing a polar wintry sky. A muster of northern lights reared their dim lances, close serried along the horizon. Throwing these into distance, rose in the foreground a head, a colossal head, inclined towards the iceberg and resting against it. Two thin hands, joined under the forehead and supporting it, drew up before the lower features a sable veil, a brow quite bloodless, white as bone, and an eye hollow and fixed, a blank of meaning, but for the glassiness of despair alone were visible. Above the temples, amidst wreathed turban folds of black drapery, vague in its character and consistency as cloud, gleamed a ring of white flame, gemmed with sparkles of a more lurid tinge. This pale crescent was the likeness of a kingly crown. What it diademed was the shape which shape had none. "'Were you happy when you painted these pictures?' asked Mr. Rochester presently. "'I was absorbed, sir. Yes, and I was happy. To paint them, in short, was to enjoy one of the keenest pleasures I have ever known.' "'That is not saying much. Your pleasures, by your own account, have been few. But I dare say you did exist in a kind of artist's dreamland while you blent and arranged these strange tints. Did you sit at them long each day?" I had nothing else to do, 
because it was the vacation, and I sat at them from morning till noon, and from noon till night. The length of the midsummer days favoured my inclination to apply. "'And you felt self-satisfied with the result of your ardent labours?' "'Far from it. I was tormented by the contrast between my idea and my handiwork. In each case I had imagined something which I was quite powerless to realise. "'Not quite. You have secured the shadow of your thought. But no more, probably. You had not enough of the artist's skill and science to give it full being. Yet the drawings are, for a schoolgirl, peculiar. As to the thoughts, they are elfish. These eyes in the evening star you must have seen in a dream. How could you make them look so clear, and yet not at all brilliant? For the planet above quells their rays. And what meaning is that in their solemn depth? And who taught you to paint wind? There is a high gale in that sky, and on this hilltop. Where did you see Latmos? For that is Latmos. There, put the drawings away." I had scarce tied the strings of the portfolio, when, looking at his watch, he said abruptly, "'It is nine o'clock. What are you about, Miss Eyre, to let Adèle sit up so long? Take her to bed.' Adèle went to kiss him before quitting the room. He endured the caress, but scarcely seemed to relish it more than Pilate would have done, nor so much. "'I wish you all good night now.' said he, making a movement of the hand towards the door, in token that he was tired of our company and wished to dismiss us. Mrs. Fairfax folded up her knitting, I took my portfolio, we curtsied to him, received a frigid bow in return, and so withdrew. "'You said Mr. Rochester was not strikingly peculiar, Mrs. Fairfax,' I observed when I rejoined her in her room, after putting Adèle to bed. "'Well, is he?' "'I think so.' He is very changeful and abrupt." "'True. No doubt he may appear so to a stranger. But I am so accustomed to his manner, I never think of it. And then if he has peculiarities of temper, allowance should be made." "'Why?" "'Partly because it is his nature. And we can none of us help our nature. And partly because he has painful thoughts, no doubt, to harass him and make his spirits unequal." "'What about?" "'Family troubles, for one thing. But he has no family. Not now, but he has had, or at least relatives. He lost his elder brother a few years since. His elder brother? Yes, the present Mr. Rochester has not been very long in possession of the property, only about nine years. Nine years is a tolerable time. Was he so very fond of his brother as to be still inconsolable for his loss? Why, no, perhaps not. I believe there was some misunderstanding between them. Mr. Rowland Rochester was not quite just to Mr. Edward, and perhaps he prejudiced his father against him. The old gentleman was fond of money, and anxious to keep the family estate together. He did not like to diminish the property by division, and yet he was anxious that Mr. Edward should have wealth too, to keep up the consequence of the name. And soon after he was of age, some steps were taken that were not quite fair, and made a great deal of mischief. Old Mr. Rochester and Mr. Rowland combined to bring Mr. Edward into what he considered a painful position, for the sake of making his fortune. What the precise nature of that position was, I never clearly knew, but his spirit could not brook what he had to suffer in it. He is not very forgiving. He broke with his family, and now for many years he has led an unsettled kind of life. I don't think he has ever been resident at Thornfield for a fortnight together, since the death of his brother without a will left him master of the estate. And indeed, no wonder he shuns the old place." "'Why should he shun it?" "'Perhaps he thinks it gloomy." The answer was evasive. I should have liked something clearer. But Mrs. Fairfax either could not or would not give me more explicit information of the origin and nature of Mr. Rochester's trials. She averred they were a mystery to herself, and that what she knew was chiefly from conjecture. It was evident, indeed, that she wished me to drop the subject, which I did accordingly. End of chapter 13 Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte Chapter 14 For several subsequent days I saw little of Mr. Rochester. In the mornings he seemed much engaged with business, and in the afternoon gentlemen from Milket or the neighbourhood called and sometimes stayed to dine with him. When his brain was well enough to admit of horse exercise, he rode out a good deal, 
probably to return these visits, as he generally did not come back till late at night. During this interval, even Adele was seldom sent for to his presence, and all my acquaintance with him was confined to an occasional rencontre in the hall, on the stairs, or in the gallery, when he would sometimes pass me haughtily and coldly, just acknowledging my presence by a distant nod or a cool glance, and sometimes bow and smile with gentlemanlike affability. His changes of mood did not offend me, because I saw that I had nothing to do with their alternation. The ebb and flow depended on causes quite disconnected with me. One day he had had company to dinner, and had sent for my portfolio, in order, doubtless, to exhibit its contents. The gentleman went away early to attend a public meeting at Milcote, as Mrs. Fairfax informed me. But the night being wet and inclement, Mr. Rochester did not accompany them. Soon after they were gone, he rang the bell. A message came that I and Adele were to go downstairs. I brushed Adele's hair and made her neat, and having ascertained that I was myself in my usual Quaker trim, where there was nothing to retouch, all being too close and plain, braided locks included to admit of disarrangement, we descended. Adele, wondering whether the petit coffre was at length come, for owing to some mistake its arrival had hitherto been delayed. She was gratified. There it stood, a little carton, on the table when we entered the dining-room. She appeared to know it by instinct. "'Ma boite! Ma boite!' exclaimed she, running towards it. "'Yes, there is your boite at last. Take it into a corner, you genuine daughter of Paris, and amuse yourself with disembowelling it.' said the deep and rather sarcastic voice of Mr. Rochester, proceeding from the depths of an immense easy-chair at the fireside. "'And mind,' he continued, "'don't bother me with any details of the anatomical process, or any notice of the condition of the entrails. Let your operation be conducted in silence. Tiens-toi tranquille, enfant, comprends-tu?' Adèle seemed scarcely to need the warning. She had already retired to a sofa with her treasure, and was busy untying the cord which secured the lid. Having removed this impediment, and lifted certain silvery envelopes of tissue paper, she merely exclaimed, "'Oh, ciel! Que c'est beau!' and then remained absorbed in ecstatic contemplation. "'Is Miss Eyre there?' now demanded the master, half rising from his seat to look round to the door, near which I still stood. "'Ah! Well, come forward. Be seated here.' He drew a chair near his own. "'I am not fond of the prattle of children,' he continued. "'For old bachelor as I am, I have no pleasant associations connected with their lisp. It would be intolerable to me to pass a whole evening tete-a-tete with a brat.' "'Don't draw that chair farther off, Miss Eyre. Sit down exactly where I placed it. If you please, that is. Confound these civilities! I continually forget them. Nor do I particularly affect simple-minded old ladies. By the by, I must have mine in mind. It won't do to neglect her. She is a Fairfax, or wed to one, and blood is said to be thicker than water.' He rang, and dispatched an invitation to Mrs. Fairfax, who soon arrived, knitting basket in hand. "'Good evening, madam. I sent to you for a charitable purpose. I have forbidden Adele to talk to me about her presence, and she is bursting with repletion. Have the goodness to serve her as an auditress and interlocutrice. It will be one of the most benevolent acts you ever performed.' Adèle, indeed, no sooner saw Mrs. Fairfax, than she summoned her to her sofa, and there quickly filled her lap with the porcelain, the ivory, the waxen contents of her boîte, pouring out, meantime, explanations and raptures, in such broken English as she was mistress of. "'Now I have performed the part of a good host,' pursued Mr. Rochester. "'Put my guests into the way of amusing each other. I ought to be at liberty to attend to my own pleasure.' "'Miss Eyre, draw your chair still a little farther forward. You are yet too far back. I cannot see you without disturbing my position in this comfortable chair, which I have no mind to do.' I did as I was bid, though I would much rather have remained somewhat in the shade. But Mr. Rochester had such a direct way of giving orders, it seemed a matter of course to obey him promptly. 
We were, as I have said, in the dining-room. The lustre, which had been lit for dinner, filled the room with a festal breadth of light. The large fire was all red and clear. The purple curtains hung rich and ample before the lofty window and loftier arch. Everything was still, save the subdued chat of Adèle, she dared not speak loud, and filling up each pause, the beating of winter rain against the panes. Mr. Rochester, as he sat in his damask-covered chair, looked different to what I had seen him look before, not quite so stern, much less gloomy. There was a smile on his lips, and his eyes sparkled, whether with wine or not I am not sure, but I think it very probable. He was, in short, in his after-dinner mood, more expanded and genial, and also more self-indulgent than the frigid and rigid temper of the morning. Still he looked preciously grim, cushioning his massive head against the swelling back of his chair, and receiving the light of the fire on his granite-hewn features, and in his great dark eyes. For he had great dark eyes, and very fine eyes, too, not without a certain change in their depth sometimes, which, if it was not softness, reminded you, at least, of that feeling. He had been looking two minutes at the fire and I had been looking the same length of time at him, when turning suddenly he caught my gaze fastened on his physiognomy. "'You examine me, Miss Eyre,' said he. "'Do you think me handsome?' I should, if I had deliberated, have replied to this question by something conventionally vague and polite, but the answer somehow slipped from my tongue before I was aware. "'No, sir.' "'Ah!' "'By my word, there is something singular about you,' said he. "'You have the air of a little nonette, quaint, quiet, grave, and simple, as you sit with your hands before you, and your eyes generally bent on the carpet, except, by the by, when they are directed piercingly to my face, as just now, for instance. And when one asks you a question, or makes a remark to which you are obliged to reply, you wrap out a round rejoinder, which, if not blunt, is at least brusque. What do you mean by it?" "'Sir, I was too plain. I beg your pardon. I ought to have replied that it was not easy to give an impromptu answer to a question about appearances, that tastes mostly differ, and that beauty is of little consequence, or something of that sort. You ought to have replied no such thing. Beauty of little consequence, indeed! And so, under pretence of softening the previous outrage, of stroking and soothing me into placidity, you stick a sly penknife under my ear. Go on. What fault do you find with me, pray? I suppose I have all my limbs and all my features like any other man?" Mr. Rochester, allow me to disown my first answer. I intended no pointed repartee, it was only a blunder." "'Just so. I think so, and you shall be answerable for it. Criticise me. Does my forehead not please you?' He lifted up the sable waves of hair, which lay horizontally over his brow, and showed a solid enough mass of intellectual organs, but an abrupt deficiency where the suave sign of benevolence should have risen. "'Now, ma'am, am I a fool?' Far from it, sir. You would perhaps think me rude if I inquired in return whether you are a philanthropist. There again! Another stick of the penknife, when she pretended to pat my head. And that is because I said I did not like the society of children and old women, low be it spoken. No, young lady, I am not a general philanthropist, but I bear a conscience and he pointed to the prominences which are said to indicate that faculty, and which, fortunately for him, was sufficiently conspicuous, giving indeed a marked breadth to the upper part of his head. And besides, I once had a kind of rude tenderness of heart. When I was as old as you, I was a feeling fellow enough, partial to the unfledged, unfostered, and unlucky. But fortune has knocked me about since. She has even kneaded me with her knuckles, and now I flatter myself I am as hard and tough as an india-rubber ball, pervious, though, through a chink or two still, and with one sentient point in the middle of the lump. Yes, does that leave hope for me?" "'Hope of what, sir?' 
of my final re-transformation from india-rubber back to flesh. Decidedly he has had too much wine, I thought, and I did not know what answer to make to his queer question. How could I tell whether he was capable of being re-transformed? You look very much puzzled, Miss Eyre. And though you are not pretty any more than I am handsome, yet a puzzled air becomes you. Besides, it is convenient, for it keeps those searching eyes of yours away from my physiognomy, and busies them with the worsted flowers of the rug. So puzzle on. Young lady, I am disposed to be gregarious and communicative to-night." With this announcement he rose from his chair, and stood, leaning his arm on the marble mantelpiece. In this attitude his shape was seen plainly as well as his face, his unusual breadth of chest, disproportionate almost to his length of limb. I am sure most people would have thought him an ugly man. Yet there was so much unconscious pride in his port, so much ease in his demeanour, such a look of complete indifference to his own external appearance, so haughty a reliance on the power of other qualities, intrinsic or adventitious, to atone for the lack of mere personal attractiveness, that in looking at him one inevitably shared the indifference, and even in a blind imperfect sense, put faith in the confidence. "'I am disposed to be gregarious and communicative to-night,' he repeated. "'And that is why I sent for you. The fire and the chandelier were not sufficient company for me. Nor would Pilate have been, for none of these can talk. Adele is a degree better, but still far below the mark. Mrs. Fairfax, ditto. You, I am persuaded, can suit me if you will. You puzzled me the first evening I invited you down here. I have almost forgotten you since. Other ideas have driven yours from my head. But to-night I am resolved to be at ease, to dismiss what importunes and recall what pleases. It would now please me to draw you out, to learn more of you. Therefore speak." Instead of speaking, I smiled, and not a very complacent or submissive smile either. Speak! he urged. What about, sir? Whatever you like. I leave both the choice of subject and the manner of treating it entirely to yourself. Accordingly, I sat and said nothing. If he expects me to talk for the mere sake of talking and showing off, he will find he has addressed himself to the wrong person, I thought. You are dumb, Miss Eyre. I was dumb still. He bent his head a little towards me, and with a single hasty glance seemed to dive into my eyes. Stubborn, he said, and annoyed. Ah, it is consistent. I put my request in an absurd, almost insolent form. Miss Eyre, I beg your pardon. The fact is, once for all, I don't wish to treat you as an inferior. That is— correcting himself. I claim only such superiority as must result from twenty years' difference in age, and a century's advance in experience. This is legitimate. Et j'y tiens, as Adele would say. And it is by virtue of this superiority, and this alone, that I desire you to have the goodness to talk to me a little now, and divert my thoughts, which are galled with dwelling on one point, cankering as a rusty nail." He had deigned an explanation almost an apology, and I did not feel insensible to his condescension, and would not seem so. I am willing to amuse you if I can, sir, quite willing, but I cannot introduce a topic, because how do I know what will interest you? Ask me questions, and I will do my best to answer them. Then in the first place, do you agree with me that I have a right to be a little masterful, abrupt, perhaps exacting sometimes, on the grounds I stated, namely, that I am old enough to be your father, and that I have battled through a varied experience with many men of many nations, and roamed over half the globe, while you have lived quietly with one set of people in one house? Do as you please, sir. That is no answer. Or rather, it is very irritating, because a very evasive one. Reply clearly." "'I don't think, sir, you have a right to command me, merely because you are older than I, or because you have seen more of the world than I have. Your claim to superiority depends on the use you have made of your time and experience." Hm. Promptly spoken! But I won't allow that, seeing it would never suit my case, as I have made an indifferent, not to say a bad, use of both advantages. 
Leaving superiority out of the question, then, you must still agree to receive my orders now and then, without being piqued or hurt by the tone of command. Will you?" I smiled. I thought to myself, Mr. Rochester is peculiar. He seems to forget that he pays me thirty pounds per annum for receiving his orders. "'The smile is very well,' said he, catching instantly the passing expression. "'But speak, too.' I was thinking, sir, that very few masters would trouble themselves to inquire whether or not their paid subordinates were piqued and hurt by their orders." "'Paid subordinates? What? You are my paid subordinate, are you? Oh, yes, I had forgotten the salary. Well, then, on that mercenary ground, will you agree to let me hector a little?" "'No, sir, not on that ground but on the ground that you did forget it, and that you care whether or not a dependent is comfortable in his dependency, I agree heartily. And will you consent to dispense with a great many conventional forms and phrases, without thinking that the omission arises from insolence?" I am sure, sir, I should never mistake informality for insolence. One I rather like, the other nothing free-born would submit to, even for a salary. Humbug. Most things free-born will submit to anything for a salary. Therefore keep to yourself, and don't venture on generalities of which you are intensely ignorant. However, I mentally shake hands with you for your answer, despite its inaccuracy, and as much for the manner in which it was said, as for the substance of the speech. The manner was frank and sincere. One does not often see such a manner. No, on the contrary affectation, or coldness, or stupid, coarse-minded misapprehension of one's meaning, are the usual rewards of candour. Not three in three thousand raw schoolgirl governesses would have answered me as you have just done. But I don't mean to flatter you. If you are cast in a different mould to the majority, it is no merit of yours. Nature did it. And then, after all, I go too fast in my conclusions. For what I yet know, you may be no better than the rest. You may have intolerable defects to counterbalance your few good points." And so may you, I thought. My eye met his, as the idea crossed my mind. He seemed to read the glance, answering as if its import had been spoken as well as imagined. "'Yes, yes, you are right,' said he. "'I have plenty of faults of my own. I know it, and I don't wish to palliate them, I assure you. God wot I need not be too severe about others. I have a past experience, a series of deeds, a colour of life to contemplate within my own breast, which I might well call my sneers and censures from my neighbours to myself. I started, or rather, for like other defaulters, I like to lay half the blame on ill fortune and adverse circumstances, was thrust on to a wrong tack at the age of when and twenty, and have never recovered the right course since. But I might have been very different. I might have been as good as you, wiser, almost disdainless. I envy you your peace of mind, your clean conscience, your unpolluted memory. Little girl, a memory without blot or contamination must be an exquisite treasure, an inexhaustible source of pure refreshment, is it not? How was your memory when you were eighteen, sir? All right, then. Limpid, salubrious. No gush of bilge-water had turned it to fetid puddle. I was your equal at eighteen, quite your equal. Nature meant me to be, on the whole, a good man, Miss Eyre, one of the better kind, and you see I am not so. You would say you don't see it. At least I flatter myself, I read as much in your eye. Beware, by the by, what you express with that organ. I am quick at interpreting its language. Then take my word for it. I am not a villain, you are not to suppose that. Not to attribute to me any such bad eminence. But owing, I verily believe, rather to circumstances than to my natural bent, I am a trite, commonplace sinner, hackneyed in all the poor, petty dissipations with which the rich and worthless try to put on life. Do you wonder that I avow this to you? Know that in the course of your future life, you will often find yourself elected the involuntarily confidant of your acquaintance's secrets. People will instinctively find out, as I have done, that it is not your forte to tell of yourself, but to listen while others talk of themselves. They will feel, too, that you listen with no malevolent scorn of their indiscretion, but with a kind of innate sympathy. 
not the less comforting and encouraging because it is very unobtrusive in its manifestations. How do you know? How can you guess all this, sir? I know it well. Therefore I proceed almost as freely as if I were writing my thoughts in a diary. You would say I should have been superior to circumstances. So I should. So I should. But you see, I was not. When fate wronged me, I had not the wisdom to remain cool. I turned desperate. Then I degenerated. Now, when any vicious simpleton excites my disgust by his paltry ribaldry, I cannot flatter myself that I am better than he. I am forced to confess that he and I are on a level. I wish I had stood firm. God knows I do. Dread remorse when you are tempted to err, Miss Eyre. Remorse is the poison of life. Repentance is said to be its cure, sir. It is not its cure. Reformation may be its cure. And I could reform. I have strength yet for that. If— But where is the use of thinking of it? hampered, burdened, cursed as I am. Besides, since happiness is irrevocably denied me, I have a right to get pleasure out of life, and I will get it, cost what it may." "'Then you will degenerate still more, sir?' "'Possibly. Yet why should I, if I can get sweet, fresh pleasure? And I may get it as sweet and fresh as the wild honey the bee gathers on the moor." "'It will sting. It will taste bitter, sir.' How do you know? You never tried it. How very serious! How very solemn you look! And you are as ignorant of the matter as this cameo head," taking one from the mantelpiece. You have no right to preach to me, you neophyte, that have not passed the porch of life, and are absolutely unacquainted with its mysteries. I only remind you of your own words, sir. You said error brought remorse, and you pronounced remorse the poison of existence. And who talks of error now? I scarcely think the notion that flitted across my brain was an error. I believe it was an inspiration rather than a temptation. It was very genial, very soothing. I know that. Here it comes again. It is no devil, I assure you. Or if it be, it has put on the robes of an angel of light. I think I must admit so fair a guest when it asks entrance to my heart. Distrust it, sir. It is not a true angel. Once more, how do you know? By what instinct do you pretend to distinguish between a fallen seraph of the abyss and a messenger from the eternal throne, between a guide and a seducer? I judge by your countenance, sir, which was troubled when you said the suggestion had returned upon you. I feel sure it will work you more misery if you listen to it." "'Not at all. It bears the most gracious message in the world. For the rest, you are not my conscience-keeper, so don't make yourself uneasy. Here, come in, bonny wanderer." He said this as if he spoke to a vision, viewless to any eye but his own. Then folding his arms, which he had half extended, on his chest, he seemed to enclose in their embrace the invisible being. Now," he continued, again addressing me, I have received the pilgrim, a disguised deity, as I verily believe. Already it has done me good. My heart was a sort of charnel. It will now be a shrine." To speak truth, sir, I don't understand you at all. I cannot keep up the conversation, because it has got out of my depth. Only one thing I know. You said you were not as good as you should like to be, and that you regretted your own imperfection. One thing I can comprehend. You intimated that to have a sullied memory was a perpetual bane. It seems to me that if you tried hard, you would in time find it possible to become what you yourself would approve, and that if from this day you began with resolution to correct your thoughts and actions, you would in a few years have laid up a new and stainless store of recollections, to which you might revert with pleasure. Justly thought, rightly said, Miss Eyre, and at this moment I am paving hell with energy. Sir, I am laying down good intentions, which I believe durable as flint. Certainly my associates and pursuits shall be other than they have been. And better? And better. So much better as pure ore as then foul dross. You seem to doubt me. 
I don't doubt myself. I know what my aim is, what my motives are. And at this moment I pass a law, unalterable as that of the Medes and Persians, that both are right. They cannot be, sir, if they require a new statute to legalize them. They are, monsieur, though they absolutely require a new statute. Unheard of combinations of circumstances demand unheard of rules. That sounds a dangerous maxim, sir, because one can see at once that it is liable to abuse. Sententious sage! So it is, but I swear by my household gods not to abuse it. You are human and fallible. I am. So are you. What then? The human and fallible should not arrogate a power with which the divine and perfect alone can be safely entrusted. What power? That of saying of any strange, unsanctioned line of action, let it be right. Let it be right. The very words, you have pronounced them. May it be right, then, I said as I rose, deeming it useless to continue a discourse which was all darkness to me, and besides, sensible that the character of my interlocutor was beyond my penetration, at least beyond its present reach, and feeling the uncertainty, the vague sense of insecurity which accompanies a conviction of ignorance. Where are you going? To put Adele to bed. It is past her bedtime. You are afraid of me because I talk like a sphinx. Your language is enigmatical, sir, but though I am bewildered, I am certainly not afraid. You are afraid. Your self-love dreads a blunder. In that sense I do feel apprehensive. I have no wish to talk nonsense. If you did, it would be in such a grave, quiet manner I should mistake it for sense. Do you never laugh, Miss Eyre? Don't trouble yourself to answer. I see you laugh rarely. But you can laugh very merrily. Believe me, you are not naturally austere, any more than I am naturally vicious. The low wood constraint still clings to you somewhat, controlling your features, muffling your voice, and restricting your limbs. And you fear in the presence of a man and a brother, or father, or master, or what you will, to smile too gaily, speak too freely, or move too quickly. But in time I think you will learn to be natural with me, as I find it impossible to be conventional with you. And then your looks and movements will have more vivacity and variety than they dare offer now. I see at intervals the glance of a curious sort of bird through the close-set bars of a cage. A vivid, restless, resolute captive is there. Were it but free, it would soar cloud-high. You are still bent on going. It has struck nine, sir. Never mind. Wait a minute. Adele is not ready to go to bed yet. My position, Miss Eyre, with my back to the fire and my face to the room, favours observation. While talking to you, I have also occasionally watched Adele. I have my own reasons for thinking her a curious study, reasons that I may, nay, that I shall impart to you some day. She pulled out of her box about ten minutes ago a little pink silk frock. Rapture lit her face as she unfolded it. Coquetry runs in her blood, blends with her brains, and seasons the marrow of her bones. "'Il faut que je sais,' cried she. "'Et à l'instant même,' she rushed out of the room. She is now with Sophie, undergoing a robing process. In a few minutes she will re-enter, and I know what I shall see. A miniature of Céline Varenne as she used to appear on the boards at the rising of— but never mind that. However, my tenderest feelings are about to receive a shock, such as my presentiment. Stay now to see whether it will be realised." Ere long, Adèle's little foot was heard tripping across the hall. She entered, transformed as her guardian had predicted. A dress of rose-coloured satin, very short, and as full in the skirt as it could be gathered, replaced the brown frock she had previously worn. A wreath of rosebuds circled her forehead. Her feet were dressed in silk stockings and small white satin sandals. "'Est-ce que ma robe va bien?' cried she, bounding forwards. "'Et mes souliers! Et mes bras! Tenez, je crois que je vais danser!' And spreading out her dress, she chassed across the room, 
till, having reached Mr. Rochester, she wheeled lightly round before him on tiptoe, then dropped on one knee at his feet, exclaiming, "'Monsieur, je vous remercie mille fois de votre bonté!' Then rising, she added, "'C'est comme cela que maman faisait, n'est-ce pas, monsieur?' "'Precisely,' was the answer. "'And comme cela she charmed my English gold out of my British breeches pocket. "'I have been green too, monsieur. I, grass-green. Not a more vernal tint freshens you now than once freshened me. My spring is gone, however, but it has left me that French floweret on my hands, which in some moods I would fain be rid of, not valuing now the root whence it sprang, having found that it was of a sort which nothing but gold dust could manure. I have but half a liking to the blossom, especially when it looks so artificial as just now. I keep it and rear it rather on the Roman Catholic principle of expiating numerous sins, great or small, by one good work. I'll explain all this some day. Good night. End of chapter 14 Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte Chapter 15 Mr. Rochester did, on a future occasion, explain it. It was one afternoon when he chanced to meet me and Adele in the grounds, and while she played with Pilot and her shuttlecock, he asked me to walk up and down a long beech avenue within sight of her. He then said that she was the daughter of a French opera dancer, Céline Varenne, towards whom he had once cherished what he called a grand passion. This passion Céline had professed to return with even superior ardour. He thought himself her idol, ugly as he was. He believed, as he said, that she preferred his tie d'athlète to the elegance of the Apollo Belvedere. "'And so, Miss Eyre, so much was I flattered by this preference of the Gallic sylph for her British gnome, that I installed her in hotel. I gave her a complete establishment of servants, a carriage, cashmeres, diamonds, dentelles, etc. In short, I began the process of ruining myself in the received style, like any other spoony. I had not, it seemed, the originality to chalk out a new road to shame and destruction, but trod the old track with stupid exactness not to deviate an inch from the beaten centre. I had, as I deserved to have, the fate of all other spoonies. Happening to call one evening when Céline did not expect me, I found her out. But it was a warm night and I was tired with strolling through Paris, so I sat down in her boudoir, happy to breathe the air consecrated so lately by her presence. No, I exaggerate. I never thought that there was any consecrating virtue about her. It was rather a sort of pastille perfume she had left, a scent of musk and amber than an odour of sanctity. I was just beginning to stifle with the fumes of conservatory flowers and sprinkled essences, when I bethought myself to open the window and step out on to the balcony. It was moonlight and gaslight besides, and very still and serene. The balcony was furnished with a chair or two. I sat down and took out a cigar. I will take one now, if you will excuse me." Here ensued a pause, filled up by the producing and lighting of a cigar. Having placed it to his lips, and breathed a trail of Havana incense on the freezing and sunless air, he went on. "'I liked bonbons, too, in those days, Miss Eyre, and I was croquant, overlooked the barbarism, croquant chocolat confit, and smoking alternately, and watching meantime the equipage that rolled along the fashionable streets toward the neighbouring opera-house, when in an elegant close carriage, drawn by a beautiful pair of English horses, and distinctly seen in the brilliant city night, I recognised the voiture I had given Céline. She was returning. Of course my heart thumped with impatience against the iron rails I leant upon. The carriage stopped, as I had expected, at the hotel door. My flame, that is the very word for an opera in Amarata, alighted. Though muffled in a cloak, an unnecessary encumbrance, by the by, on so warm a June evening, I knew her instantly by her little foot, seen peeping from the skirt of her dress as she skipped from the carriage step. Bending over the balcony, I was about to murmur, Mon ange, in a tone, of course, which should be audible to the ear of love alone, when a figure jumped from the carriage after her cloaked also. 
But that was a spurred heel which had rung on the pavement, and that was a hatted head which now passed under the arched porte cochere of the hotel. "'You never felt jealousy, did you, Miss Eyre? Of course not. I need not ask you, because you have never felt love. You have both sentiments yet to experience. Your soul sleeps. The shock is yet to be given which shall waken it. You think all existence lapses in as quiet a flow as that in which your youth has hitherto slid away. Floating on with closed eyes and muffled ears, you neither see the rocks bristling not far off on the bed of the flood, nor hear the breakers boil at their base. But I tell you, and you may mark my words, you will come some day to a craggy pass in the channel, where the whole of life's stream will be broken up into whirl and tumult, foam and noise. Either you will be dashed to atoms on crag points, or lifted up and borne on by some master wave into a calmer current, as I am now. I like this day. I like that sky of steel. I like the sternness and stillness of the world under this frost. I like Thornfield, its antiquity, its retirement, its old crow-trees and thorn-trees, its grey façade and lines of dark windows reflecting that metal welkin. And yet how long have I abhorred the very thought of it, shunned it like a great plague-house? How do I still abhor? He ground his teeth and was silent. He arrested his step and struck his boot against the hard ground. Some hated thought seemed to have him in its grip, and to hold him so tightly that he could not advance. We were ascending the avenue when he thus paused. The hall was before us. Lifting his eye to its battlements, he cast over them a glare such as I had never saw before or since. Pain, shame, ire, impatience, disgust, detestation, seemed momentarily to hold a quivering conflict in the large pupil, dilating under his ebon eyebrow. Wild was the wrestle which should be paramount. But another feeling rose and triumphed. Something hard and cynical, self-willed and resolute. It settled his passion and petrified his countenance. He went on. During the moment I was silent, Miss Eyre, I was arranging a point with my destiny. She stood there by that beech-trunk, a hag like one of those who appeared to Macbeth on the heath of forest. "'You like Thornfield?' she said, lifting her finger. And then she wrote in the air a memento, which ran in lurid hieroglyphics all along the house-front, between the upper and lower row of windows. Like it if you can, like it if you dare. I will like it, said I. I dare like it. And, he subjoined moodily, I will keep my word. I will break obstacles to happiness, to goodness, yes, goodness. I wish to be a better man than I have been, than I am, as Job's leviathan broke the spear, the dart, and the habergeon, hindrances which others count as iron and brass, I will esteem but straw and rotten wood." Adele here ran before him with her shuttlecock. "'Away!' he cried harshly. "'Keep at a distance, child, or go in to Sophie.' Continuing then to pursue his walk in silence, I ventured to recall him to the point where he had abruptly diverged. "'Did you leave the balcony, sir?' I asked, when Mademoiselle Varenne entered. I almost expected a rebuff for this hardly well-timed question, but on the contrary, waking out of his scowling abstraction, he turned his eyes towards me, and the shade seemed to clear off his brow. "'Oh, I had forgotten Céline. Well, to resume—' When I saw my charmer thus come in accompanied by a cavalier, I seemed to hear a hiss, and the green snake of jealousy rising on undulating coils from the moonlit balcony, glided within my waistcoat, and ate its way in two minutes to my heart's core. Strange! he exclaimed, suddenly starting again from the point. Strange that I should choose you for the confidant of all this young lady! passing strange that you should listen to me quietly, as if it were the most usual thing in the world for a man like me to tell stories of his opera-mistress to a quaint, inexperienced girl like you. But the last singularity explains the first, as I intimated once before. 
You, with your gravity, considerateness, and caution, were made to be the recipient of secrets. Besides, I know what sort of a mind I have placed in communication with my own. I know it is one not liable to take infection. It is a peculiar mind. It is a unique one. Happily I do not mean to harm it. But if I did, it would not take harm from me. The more you and I converse, the better, for while I cannot blight you, you may refresh me." After this digression, he proceeded. I remained in the balcony. They will come to her boudoir, no doubt, thought I. Let me prepare an ambush. So putting my hand in through the open window, I drew the curtain over it, leaving only an opening through which I could take observations. Then I closed the casement, all but a chink just wide enough to furnish an outlet to lovers' whispered vows. Then I stole back to my chair, and as I resumed it, the pair came in. My eye was quickly at the aperture. Celine's chambermaid entered, lit a lamp, left it on the table, and withdrew. The couple were thus revealed to me clearly. Both removed their cloaks, and there was the Varenne, shining in satin and jewels my gifts, of course, and there was her companion in an officer's uniform, and I knew him for a young roué of a vicomte, a brainless and vicious youth whom I had sometimes met in society, and had never thought of hating because I despised him so absolutely. On recognising him, the fang of the snake jealousy was instantly broken, because at the same moment my love for Celine sank under an extinguisher. A woman who could betray me for such a rival was not worth contending for. She deserved only scorn, less, however, than I, who had been her dupe. They began to talk. Their conversation eased me completely. Frivolous, mercenary, heartless, and senseless, it was rather calculated to weary than enrage a listener. A card of mine lay on the table. This, being perceived, brought my name under discussion. Neither of them possessed an energy or wit to belabour me soundly, but they insulted me as coarsely as they could in their little way, especially Celine, who even waxed rather brilliant on my personal defects, deformities, she termed them. Now it had been her custom to launch out into fervent admiration of what she called my beauté mal, wherein she differed diametrically from you, who told me point-blank at the second interview that you did not think me handsome. The contrast struck me at the time, and— Adèle here came running up again. "'Monsieur, John has just been to say that your agent has called and wished to see you.' "'Ah! In that case I must abridge. Opening the window, I walked in upon them, liberated Celine from my protection, gave her notice to vacate her hotel, offered her a purse for immediate exigencies, disregarded screams, hysterics, prayers, protestations, convulsions, made an appointment with the Vicomte for a meeting at the Bois de Boulogne. Next morning I had the pleasure of encountering him, left a bullet in one of his poor etiolated arms, feeble as the wing of a chicken in the pip, and then thought I had done with the whole crew. But unluckily the Varenne, six months before, had given me this fillette Adèle, who, she affirmed, was my daughter. And perhaps she may be though I see no proofs of such grim paternity written in her countenance. Pilot is more like me than she. Some years after I had broken with the mother, she abandoned her child, and ran away to Italy with a musician or singer. I acknowledged no natural claim on Adèle's part to be more supported by me, nor do I now acknowledge any, for I am not her father. But hearing that she was quite destitute, I e'en took the poor thing out of the slime and mud of Paris, and transplanted it here, to grow up a clean in the wholesome soil of an English country garden. Mrs. Fairfax found you to train it. But now you know that it is the illegitimate offspring of a French opera girl, you will perhaps think differently of your post and protégé. You will be coming to me some day with notice that you have found another place, that you beg me to look out for a new governess, etc. Eh? No. Adèle is not answerable for either her mother's faults or yours. I have a regard for her, and now that I know she is, in a sense, parentless, forsaken by her mother and disowned by you, sir, I shall cling closer to her than before. How could I possibly prefer the spoilt pet of a wealthy family, who would hate her governess as a nuisance, to a lonely little orphan, who leans towards her as a friend? Oh, that is the light in which you view it. Well, I must go in now, and you too. 
it darkens. But I stayed out a few minutes longer with Adèle and Pilot, ran a race with her, and played a game of battledore and shuttlecock. When we went in, and I had removed her bonnet and coat, I took her on my knee, kept her there an hour, allowing her to prattle as she liked, not rebuking even some little freedoms and trivialities into which she was apt to stray when much noticed, and which betrayed in her a superficiality of character, inherited probably from her mother, hardly congenial to an English mind. Still she had her merits, and I was disposed to appreciate all that was good in her to the utmost. I sought in her countenance and features a likeness to Mr. Rochester, but found none. No trait, no turn of expression announced relationship. It was a pity, if she could but have been proved to resemble him, he would have thought more of her. It was not till after I had withdrawn to my own chamber for the night that I steadily reviewed the tale Mr. Rochester had told me. As he had said, there was probably nothing at all extraordinary in the substance of the narrative itself. A wealthy Englishman's passion for a French dancer, and her treachery to him, were every-day matters enough, no doubt, in society. But there was something decidedly strange in the paroxysm of emotion which had suddenly seized him, when he was in the act of expressing the present contentment of his mood, and his newly revived pleasure in the old hall and its environs. I meditated wonderingly on this incident. But gradually quitting it, as I found it for the present inexplicable, I turned to the consideration of my master's manner to myself. The confidence he had thought fit to repose in me seemed a tribute to my discretion. I regarded and accepted it as such. His deportment had now, for some weeks, been more uniform towards me than at the first. I never seemed in his way. He did not take fits of chilling hauteur. When he met me unexpectedly, the encounter seemed welcome. He had always a word, and sometimes a smile for me. When summoned by formal invitation to his presence, I was honoured by a cordiality of reception that made me feel I really possessed the power to amuse him, and that these evening conferences were sought as much for his pleasure as for my benefit. I indeed talked comparatively little, but I heard him talk with relish. It was his nature to be communicative. He liked to open to a mind unacquainted with the world glimpses of its scenes and ways. I do not mean its corrupt scenes and wicked ways, but such as derived their interest from the great scale on which they were acted, the strange novelty by which they were characterised. And I had a keen delight in receiving the new ideas he offered, in imagining the new pictures he portrayed, and following him in thought through the new regions he disclosed, never startled or troubled by one noxious illusion. The ease of his manner freed me from painful restraint. The friendly frankness, as correct as cordial, with which he treated me, drew me to him. I felt at times as if he were my relation rather than my master. Yet he was imperious sometimes still. But I did not mind that. I saw it was his way. So happy, so gratified did I become with this new interest added to life, that I ceased to pine after kindred. My thin crescent destiny seemed to enlarge. The blanks of existence were filled up. My bodily health improved, I gathered flesh and strength. And was Mr. Rochester now ugly in my eyes? No, reader. Gratitude and many associations, all pleasurable and genial, made his face the object I best liked to see. His presence in a room was more cheering than the brightest fire. Yet I had not forgotten his faults. Indeed I could not, for he brought them frequently before me. He was proud, sardonic harsh to inferiority of every description. In my secret soul I knew that his great kindness to me was balanced by unjust severity to many others. He was moody, too, unaccountably so. I more than once, when sent for to read to him, found him sitting in his library alone, with his head bent on his folded arms, and when he looked up, a morose, almost a malignant scowl blackened his features. But I believed that his moodiness, his harshness, and his former faults of morality—I say former, for now he seemed corrected of them—had their source in some cruel cross of fate. I believed he was naturally a man of better tendencies, higher principles, and purer taste than such as circumstances had developed, education instilled, or destiny encouraged. I thought there were excellent materials in him though for the present they hung together somewhat spoiled and tangled. 
I cannot deny that I grieved for his grief, whatever that was, and would have given much to assuage it. Though I had now extinguished my candle and was laid down in bed, I could not sleep for thinking of his look when he paused in the avenue, and told how his destiny had risen up before him, and dared him to be happy at Thornfield. "'Why not?' I asked myself. "'What alienates him from the house? Will he leave it again soon? Mrs. Fairfax said he seldom stayed here longer than a fortnight at a time, and he has now been resident eight weeks. If he does go, the change will be doleful. Suppose he should be absent spring, summer, and autumn. How joyless sunshine and fine days will seem! I hardly know whether I had slept or not after this musing. At any rate, I started wide awake on hearing a vague murmur, peculiar and lugubrious, which sounded, I thought, just above me. I wished I had kept my candle burning. The night was drearily dark. My spirits were depressed. I rose and sat up in bed, listening. The sound was hushed. I tried again to sleep, but my heart beat anxiously. My inward tranquillity was broken. The clock, far down in the hall, struck two. Just then it seemed my chamber door was touched, as if fingers had swept the panels in groping away along the dark gallery outside. I said, "'Who is there?' Nothing answered. I was chilled with fear. All at once I remembered that it might be Pilot, who, when the kitchen door chanced to be left open, not unfrequently found his way up to the threshold of Mr. Rochester's chamber. I had seen him lying there myself in the mornings. The idea calmed me somewhat. I lay down. Silence composes the nerves, and as an unbroken hush now reigned again through the whole house, I began to feel the return of slumber. But it was not fated that I should sleep that night. A dream had scarcely approached my ear, when it fled affrighted, scared by a marrow freezing incident enough. This was a demonic laugh, low, suppressed, and deep uttered as it seemed at the very keyhole of my chamber door. The head of my bed was near the door, and I thought at first the goblin laugher stood at my bedside, or rather crouched by my pillow. But I rose, looked round, and could see nothing. While as I still gazed, the unnatural sound was reiterated, and I knew it came from behind the panels. My first impulse was to rise and fasten the bolt, my next again to cry out, "'Who is there?' Something gurgled and moaned. Ere long, steps retreated up the gallery towards the third-story staircase. A door had lately been made to shut in that staircase. I heard it open and close, and all was still. Was that Grace Poole? And is she possessed with a devil? thought I. Impossible now to remain longer by myself. I must go to Mrs. Fairfax. I hurried on my frock and a shawl. I withdrew the bolt and opened the door with a trembling hand. There was a candle burning just outside, and on the matting in the gallery. I was surprised at this circumstance, but still more was I amazed to perceive the air quite dim, as if filled with smoke, and while looking to the right hand and left to find whence these blue wreaths issued, I became further aware of a strong smell of burning. Something creaked. It was a door ajar, and that door was Mr. Rochester's, and the smoke rushed in a cloud from thence. I thought no more of Mrs. Fairfax. I thought no more of Grace Poole or the laugh. In an instant I was within the chamber. Tongues of flame darted round the bed. The curtains were on fire. In the midst of blaze and vapour, Mr. Rochester lay stretched motionless in deep sleep. "'Wake! Wake!' I cried. I shook him, but he only murmured and turned. The smoke had stupefied him. Not one moment could be lost. The very sheets were kindling. I rushed to his basin and ewer. Fortunately one was wide and the other deep, and both were filled with water. I heaved them up, deluged the bed and its occupant, flew back to my own room, brought my own water-jug, baptized the couch afresh, and by God's aid succeeded in extinguishing the flames which were devouring it. The hiss of the quenched element! the breakage of a pitcher which I flung from my hand when I had emptied it, and above all the splash of the shower-bath I had liberally bestowed, roused Mr. Rochester at last. Though it was now dark, I knew he was awake, because I heard him fulminating strange anathemas at finding himself lying in a pool of water. "'Is there a flood?' he cried. "'No, sir,' I answered. 
But there has been a fire. Get up, do. You are quenched now. I will fetch you a candle." "'In the names of all the elves in Christendom, is that Jane Eyre?' he demanded. "'What have you done with me, witch, sorceress? Who was in the room besides you? Have you plotted to drown me?' "'I will fetch you a candle, sir, and in heaven's name get up. Somebody has plotted something. You cannot too soon find out who and what it is." "'There! I am up now. But at your peril you fetch a candle yet. Wait two minutes till I get into some dry garments, if any dry there be. Yes, here is my dressing-gown. Now run!' I did run. I brought the candle which still remained in the gallery. He took it from my hand, held it up, and surveyed the bed, all blackened and scorched, the sheets drenched, the carpet round, swimming in water. "'What is it? And who did it?' he asked. I briefly related to him what had transpired, the strange laugh I had heard in the gallery, the step ascending to the third story, the smoke, the smell of fire which had conducted me to his room in what state I had found matters there, and how I had deluged him with all the water I could lay hands on. He listened very gravely. His face, as I went on, expressed more concern than astonishment. He did not immediately speak when I had concluded. "'Shall I call Mrs. Fairfax?' I asked. "'Mrs. Fairfax? No. What the deuce would you call her for? What can she do? Let her sleep unmolested.' Then I will fetch Leah, and wake John and his wife. Not at all. Just be still. You have a shawl on. If you are not warm enough, you may take my cloak yonder. Wrap it about you, and sit down in the armchair. There, I will put it on. Now place your feet on the stool to keep them out of the wet. I am going to leave you a few minutes. I shall take the candle. Remain where you are till I return. Be as still as a mouse. I must pay a visit to the second story. Don't move, remember, or call any one." He went. I watched the light withdraw. He passed up the gallery very softly, unclosed the staircase door with as little noise as possible, shut it after him, and the last ray vanished. I was left in total darkness. I listened for some noise, but heard nothing. A very long time elapsed. I grew weary. It was cold in spite of the cloak and then I did not see the use of staying, as I was not to rouse the house. I was at the point of risking Mr. Rochester's displeasure by disobeying his orders, when the light once more gleamed dimly on the gallery wall, and I heard his unshod feet tread the matting. I hope it is he, thought I, and not something worse. He re-entered, pale and very gloomy. "'I have found it all out,' said he, setting his candle down on the washstand. It is as I thought. How, sir? He made no reply, but stood with his arms folded, looking at the ground. At the end of a few minutes he inquired in rather a peculiar tone. I forget whether you said you saw anything when you opened your chamber door. No, sir. Only the candlestick on the ground. But you heard an odd laugh. You have heard that laugh before, I should think, or something like it. Yes, sir. There is a woman who sews here, called Grace Poole. She laughs in that way. She is a singular person." "'Just so. Grace Poole, you have guessed it. She is, as you say, singular. Very. Well, I shall reflect on the subject. Meantime, I am glad that you were the only person besides myself acquainted with the precise details of to-night's incident. You are no talking fool. Say nothing about it. I will account for this state of affairs pointing to the bed. And now return to your own room. I shall do very well on the sofa in the library for the rest of the night. It is near four. In two hours the servants will be up." "'Good night, then, sir,' said I, departing." He seemed surprised, very inconsistently so, as he had just told me to go. "'What?' he exclaimed. "'Are you quitting me already, and in that way?' "'You said I might go, sir.' But not without taking leave, not without a word or two of acknowledgment and good will, not in short in that brief, dry fashion. Why, you have saved my life, snatched me from a horrible and excruciating death, and you walk past me as if we were mutual strangers. At least shake hands." He held out his hand. I gave him mine. He took it first in one, 
than in both his own. "'You have saved my life. I have a pleasure in owing you so immense a debt. I cannot say more. Nothing else that has been would have been tolerable to me in the character of creditor for such an obligation. But you—it is different. I feel your benefits no burden, Jane." He paused, gazed at me. Words almost visible trembled on his lips, but his voice was checked. "'Good night again, sir. There is no debt, benefit, burden, obligation in the case." "'I knew,' he continued, "'you would do me good in some way, at some time. I saw it in your eyes when I first beheld you. Their expression and smile did not—' Again he stopped. "'Did not?' he proceeded hastily. Strike delight to my very inmost heart, so for nothing. People talk of natural sympathies. I have heard of good genii. There are grains of truth in the wildest fable. My cherished preserver, good night." Strange energy was in his voice, strange fire in his look. "'I am glad I happen to be awake,' I said, and then I was going. What? You will go?" I am cold, sir. Cold? Yes, and standing in a pool. Go then, Jane, go. But still he retained my hand, and I could not free it. I bethought myself an expedient. I think I hear Mrs. Fairfax move, sir, said I. Well, leave me. He relaxed his fingers, and I was gone. I regained my couch, but never thought of sleep. Till morning dawned I was tossed on a buoyant but unquiet sea, where billows of trouble rolled under surges of joy. I thought sometimes I saw beyond its wild waters a shore, sweet as the hills of Beulah, and now and then a freshening gale, wakened by hope, bore my spirit triumphantly towards the bourn. But I could not reach it, even in fancy. A counteracting breeze blew off land and continually drove me back. Sense would resist delirium, judgment would warn passion. Too feverish to rest, I rose as soon as day dawned. End of chapter 15 Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte Chapter 16 I both wished and feared to see Mr. Rochester on the day which followed this sleepless night. I wanted to hear his voice again, yet feared to meet his eye. During the early part of the morning I momentarily expected his coming. He was not in the frequent habit of entering the schoolroom, but he did step in for a few minutes sometimes, and I had the impression that he was sure to visit it that day. But the morning passed just as usual. Nothing happened to interrupt the quiet course of Adele's studies. Only soon after breakfast I heard some bustle in the neighbourhood of Mr. Rochester's chamber, Mrs. Fairfax's voice, and Leah's, and the cook's, that is, John's wife, and even John's own gruff tones. There were exclamations of, "'What a mercy, Master, was not burnt in his bed!' "'It is always dangerous to keep a candle lit at night. How providential that he had presence of mind to think of the water-jug! I wonder he waked nobody. It is to be hoped he will not take cold with sleeping on the library sofa, etc. To much confabulation succeeded a sound of scrubbing and setting to rights, and when I passed the room, in going downstairs to dinner, I saw through the open door that all was again restored to complete order, only the bed was stripped of its hangings. Leah stood up in the window-seat, rubbing the panes of glass dimmed with smoke. I was about to address her, for I wished to know what account had been given of the affair. But on advancing I saw a second person in the chamber, a woman sitting on a chair by the bedside, and sewing rings to new curtains. That woman was no other than Grace Poole. There she sat, staid and taciturn, looking as usual in her brown stuff gown, her check apron, white handkerchief and cap. She was intent on her work, in which her whole thoughts seemed absorbed. On her hard forehead, and in her commonplace features, was nothing either of the paleness or desperation one would have expected to see marking the countenance of a woman who had attempted murder, 
and whose intended victim had followed her late last night to her lair, and, as I believed, charged her with the crime she wished to perpetrate. I was amazed, confounded. She looked up, while I still gazed at her. No start, no increase or failure of colour betrayed emotion, consciousness of guilt, or fear of detection. She said, "'Good morning, miss,' in her usual phlegmatic and brief manner, and taking up another ring and more tape, went on with her sewing. "'I will put her to some test,' thought I. "'Such absolute impenetrability is past comprehension.' "'Good morning, Grace,' I said. "'Has anything happened here?' I thought I heard the servants all talking together a while ago. Only Master had been reading in his bed last night. He fell asleep with his candle lit, and the curtains got on fire, but fortunately he awoke before the bedclothes or the woodwork caught, and contrived to quench the flames with the water in the ewer. "'A strange affair,' I said, in a low voice. Then looking at her fixedly, "'Did Mr. Rochester wake nobody? Did no one hear him move?' She again raised her eyes to me and this time there was something of consciousness in her expression. She seemed to examine me warily. Then she answered, "'The servants sleep so far off, you know, miss, they would not be likely to hear. Mrs. Fairfax's room and yours are the nearest to Master's, but Mrs. Fairfax said she heard nothing. When people get elderly they often sleep heavy.' She paused, and then added with a sort of assumed indifference, but still in a marked and significant tone. "'But you are young, miss, and I should say a light sleeper. Perhaps you may have heard a noise.' "'I did,' said I, dropping my voice, so that Leah, who was still polishing the panes, could not hear me. And at first I thought it was Pilate. But Pilate cannot laugh, and I am certain I heard a laugh, and a strange one. She took a new needleful of thread, waxed it carefully, threaded her needle with steady hand, and then observed with perfect composure. "'It is hardly likely Master would laugh, I should think, miss, when he was in such danger. He must have been dreaming.' "'I was not dreaming,' I said, with some warmth, for her brazen coolness provoked me. Again she looked at me, and with the same scrutinising and conscious eye. "'Have you told Master that you heard a laugh?' she inquired. I have not had the opportunity of speaking to him this morning. "'You did not think of opening your door and looking out into the gallery?' she further asked. She appeared to be cross-questioning me, attempting to draw from me information unawares. The idea struck me that if she discovered I knew or suspected her guilt, she would be playing some of her malignant pranks on me. I thought it advisable to be on my guard. "'On the contrary,' said I, "'I bolted my door.' Then you are not in the habit of bolting your door every night before you get into bed. Fiend! She wants to know my habits, that she may lay her plans accordingly. Indignation again prevailed over prudence. I replied sharply, Hitherto I have often omitted to fasten the bolt. I did not think it necessary. I was not aware any danger or annoyance was to be dreaded at Thornfield Hall. But in future— And I laid marked stress on the words— I shall take good care to make all secure before I venture to lie down." "'It will be wise to do so,' was her answer. "'This neighbourhood is as quiet as any I know, and I never heard of the hall being attempted by robbers since it was a house, though there are hundreds of pounds worth of plate in the plate-closet, as is well known. And you see, for such a large house there are very few servants, because Master has never lived here much, and when he does come, being a bachelor, he needs little waiting on. But I always think it best to err on the safe side. A door is soon fastened, and it is well to have a drawn bolt between one and any mischief that may be about. A deal of people, miss, are for trusting all to Providence, but I say Providence will not dispense with the means, though he often blesses them when they are used discreetly." And here she closed her harangue, a long one for her, and uttered with the demureness of a Quakeress. I still stood absolutely dumbfounded at what appeared to be her miraculous self-possession and most inscrutable hypocrisy, when the cook entered. "'Mrs. Poole,' said she, addressing Grace, "'the servant's dinner will soon be ready. Will you come down?' "'No. Just put my pint of porter and a bit of pudding on a tray, and I'll carry it upstairs.' "'You'll have some meat?' "'Just a morsel, and a taste of cheese, that's all.' "'And the sago?' "'Never mind it at present.' I shall be coming down before tea-time, I'll make it myself." 
The cook here turned to me, saying that Mrs. Fairfax was waiting for me, so I departed. I hardly heard Mrs. Fairfax's account of the curtain conflagration during dinner, so much was I occupied in puzzling my brains over the enigmatical character of Grace Poole, and still more in pondering the problem of her position at Thornfield, and questioning why she had not been given into custody that morning, or at the very least dismissed from her master's service. He had almost as much as declared his conviction of her criminality last night. What mysterious cause withheld him from accusing her? Why had he enjoined me, too, to secrecy? It was strange. A bold, vindictive, and haughty gentleman seemed somehow in the power of one of the meanest of his dependents, so much in her power, that even when she lifted her hand against his life, he dared not openly charge her with the attempt, much less punish her for it. Had Grace been young and handsome, I should have been tempted to think that tenderer feelings than prudence or fear influenced Mr. Rochester in her behalf. But, hard-favoured and matronly as she was, the idea could not be admitted. Yet, I reflected, she has been young once. Her youth would be contemporary with her master's. Mrs. Fairfax told me once she had lived here many years. I don't think she can ever have been pretty. But for aught I know, she may possess originality and strength of character, to compensate for the want of personal advantages. Mr. Rochester is an amateur of the decided and eccentric. Grace is eccentric, at least. What of a former caprice? A freak very possible to a nature so sudden and headstrong as his, has delivered him into her power, and she now exercises over his actions a secret influence, the result of his own indiscretion which he cannot shake off, and dare not disregard. But having reached this point of conjecture, Mrs. Poole's square, flat figure, and uncomely, dry, even coarse face, recurred so distinctly to my mind's eye that I thought, no, impossible, my supposition cannot be correct. Yet, suggested the secret voice which talks to us in our own hearts, you are not beautiful either, and perhaps Mr. Rochester reproves you. At any rate, you have often felt as if he did. And last night, remember his words, remember his look, remember his voice. I well remembered all. Language, glance, and tone seemed at the moment vividly renewed. I was now in the schoolroom. Adèle was drawing. I bent over her and directed her pencil. She looked up with a sort of start. "'Qu'avez-vous, mademoiselle?' said she. "'Vos doigts tremblent comme la feuille, et vos joues sont rouges.' Mais rouge comme des cerises. I am hot, Adèle, with stooping. She went on sketching. I went on thinking. I hastened to drive from my mind the hateful notion I had been conceiving respecting Grace Poole. It disgusted me. I compared myself with her and found we were different. Bessie Levin had said I was quite a lady, and she spoke truth. I was a lady, and now I looked much better than I did when Bessie saw me. I had more colour and more flesh, more life, more vivacity, because I had brighter hopes and keener enjoyments. "'Evening approaches,' said I, as I looked towards the window. I had never heard Mr. Rochester's voice or step in the house to-day, but surely I shall see him before night. I feared the meeting in the morning. Now I desire it, because expectation has been so long baffled that it has grown impatient. When dusk actually closed, and when Adèle left me to go and play in the nursery with Sophie, I did most keenly desire it. I listened for the bell to ring below. I listened for Leah coming up with a message. I fancied sometimes I heard Mr. Rochester's own tread, and I turned to the door expecting it to open and admit him. The door remained shut. Darkness only came in through the window. Still it was not late. He often sent for me at seven and eight o'clock, and it was yet but six. Surely I should not be wholly disappointed to-night, when I had so many things to say to him. I wanted again to introduce the subject of Grace Poole, and to hear what he would answer. I wanted to ask him plainly if he really believed it was she who had made last night's hideous attempt, and if so, why he kept her wickedness a secret. It little mattered whether my curiosity irritated him. I knew the pleasure of vexing and soothing him by turns. It was one I chiefly delighted in, and a sure instinct always prevented me from going too far. Beyond the verge of provocation I never ventured. On the extreme brink I liked well to try my skill. Retaining every minute form of respect, 
every propriety of my station, I could still meet him in argument without fear or uneasy restraint. This suited both him and me. A tread creaked on the stairs at last. Leah made her appearance, but it was only to intimate that tea was ready in Mrs. Fairfax's room. Thither I repaired, glad at least to go downstairs, for that brought me, I imagined, nearer to Mr. Rochester's presence. "'You must want your tea,' said the good lady, as I joined her. "'You ate so little at dinner. I am afraid,' she continued, "'you are not well to-day. You look flushed and feverish.' "'Oh, quite well. I never felt better.' "'Then you must prove it by evincing a good appetite. Will you fill the teapot while I knit off this needle?' Having completed her task, she rose to draw down the blind, which she had hitherto kept up, by way, I suppose, of making the most of daylight, though dusk was now fast deepening into total obscurity. "'It is fair to-night,' said she, as she looked through the panes, "'though not starlight. Mr. Rochester has, on the whole, had a favourable day for his journey.' "'Journey? Is Mr. Rochester gone anywhere? I did not know he was out.' "'Oh, he set off the moment he had breakfasted. He has gone to the Lees, Mr. Eshton's place, ten miles on the other side Milkett. I believe there is quite a party assembled there. Lord Ingram, Sir George Lynn, Colonel Dent, and others. Do you expect him back to-night? No, nor to-morrow either. I should think he is very likely to say a week or more. When these fine, fashionable people get together, they are so surrounded by elegance and gaiety, so well provided with all that can please and entertain, they are in no hurry to separate. Gentlemen, especially, are often in request on such occasions, and Mr. Rochester is so talented and so lively in society, that I believe he is a general favourite. The ladies are very fond of him, though you would not think his appearance calculated to recommend him particularly in their eyes. But I suppose his acquirements and abilities, perhaps his wealth and good blood, make amends for any little fault of look. Are there ladies at the Lees? There are Mrs. Eshton and her three daughters. Very elegant young ladies, indeed, and there are the Honourable Blanche and Mary Ingram, most beautiful women, I suppose. Indeed, I have seen Blanche, six or seven years since, when she was a girl of eighteen. She came here to a Christmas ball and party Mr. Rochester gave. You should have seen the dining-room that day. How richly it was decorated, how brilliantly lit up! I should think there were fifty ladies and gentlemen present, all of the first county families, and Miss Ingram was considered the belle of the evening. You saw her, you say, Mrs. Fairfax. What was she like? Oh, yes, I saw her. The dining-room doors were thrown open, and as it was Christmas time, the servants were allowed to assemble in the hall, to hear some of the ladies sing and play. Mr. Rochester would have me to come in, and I sat down in a quiet corner and watched them. I never saw a most splendid scene. The ladies were magnificently dressed. Most of them, at least most of the younger ones, looked handsome, but Miss Ingram was certainly the Queen. And what was she like? Tall, fine bust, sloping shoulders, long, graceful neck, olive complexion, dark and clear, noble features, eyes rather like Mr. Rochester's, large and black, and as brilliant as her jewels. And then she had such a fine head of hair, raven black, and so becomingly arranged, a crown of thick plaits behind, and in front the longest, the glossiest curls I ever saw. She was dressed in pure white. An amber-coloured scarf was passed over her shoulders and across her breast, tied at the side, and descending in a long fringed end below her knee. She wore an amber-coloured flower, too, in her hair. It contrasted well with the jetty mass of her curls. She was greatly admired, of course. Yes, indeed, and not only for her beauty, but for her accomplishments. She was one of the ladies who sang. A gentleman accompanied her on the piano. She and Mr. Rochester sang a duet. Mr. Rochester? I was not aware he could sing. Oh, he has a fine bass voice, and an excellent taste for music. And Miss Ingram, what sort of a voice had she? A very rich and powerful one. She sang delightfully. It was a treat to listen to her, and she played afterwards. I am no judge of music, but Mr. Rochester is, and I heard him say her execution was remarkably good. And this beautiful and accomplished lady, she is not yet married. It appears not. I fancy neither she nor her sister have very large fortunes. Old Lord Ingram's estates was chiefly entailed, and the eldest son came in for everything almost. 
But I wonder no worthy nobleman or gentleman has taken a fancy to her. Mr. Rochester, for instance. He is rich, is he not? Oh, yes. But you see there is a considerable difference in age. Mr. Rochester is nearly forty. She is but twenty-five. What of that? More unequal matches are made every day. True. Yet I should scarcely fancy Mr. Rochester would entertain an idea of the sort. But you eat nothing. You have scarcely tasted since you began tea. No. I am too thirsty to eat. Will you let me have another cup? I was about again to revert to the probability of a union between Mr. Rochester and the beautiful Blanche, but Adèle came in, and the conversation was turned into another channel. When once more alone I reviewed the information I had got, looked into my heart, examined its thoughts and feelings, and endeavoured to bring back with a strict hand such as had been straying through imagination's boundless and trackless waste into the safe fold of common sense. Arraigned at my own bar, memory, having given her evidence of the hopes, wishes, sentiments I had been cherishing since last night, of the general state of mind in which I had indulged for nearly a fortnight past, reason having come forward and told, in her own quiet way, a plain, unvarnished tale, showing how I had rejected the real and rabidly devoured the ideal, I pronounced judgment to this effect that a greater fool than Jane Eyre had never breathed the breath of life, that a more fantastic idiot had never surfeited herself on sweet lies, and swallowed poison as if it were nectar. You, I said, a favourite with Mr. Rochester! You, gifted with the power of pleasing him! You, of importance to him in any way! Go! Your folly sickens me! And you have derived pleasure from occasional tokens of preference, equivocal tokens shown by a gentleman of family, and a man of the world who a dependent and a novice. How dared you! Poor stupid dupe! Could not even self-interest make you wiser? You repeated to yourself this morning the brief scene of last night. Cover your face and be ashamed. He said something in praise of your eyes, did he? Blind puppy! Open their bleared lids, and look on your own accursed senselessness. It does good to no woman to be flattered by her superior, who cannot possibly intend to marry her. And it is madness in all women to let a secret love kindle within them, which, if unreturned and unknown, must devour the life that feeds it, and, if discovered and responded to, must lead, ignis fatus-like, into miry wilds whence there is no extrication. Listen, then, Jane Eyre, to your sentence. To-morrow, place the glass before you, and draw in chalk your own picture, faithfully, without softening one defect, omit no harsh line, smooth away no displeasing regularity, write under it, portrait of a governess, disconnected, poor, and plain. Afterwards, take a piece of smooth ivory, you have one prepared in your drawing-box, Take your palette, mix your freshest, finest, clearest tints, choose your most delicate camel-hair pencils, delineate carefully the loveliest face you can imagine, paint it in your softest shades and sweetest lines, according to the description given by Mrs. Fairfax of Blanche Ingram. Remember the raven ringlets, the oriental eye. What? You revert to Mr. Rochester as a model. Order. No snivel, no sentiment, no regret. I will endure only sense and resolution. Recall the august yet harmonious lineaments, the Grecian neck and bust. Let the round and dazzling arm be visible, and the delicate hand. Omit neither diamond ring nor gold bracelet. Portray faithfully the attire, aerial lace and glistening satin, graceful scarf and golden rose. Call it Blanche, an accomplished lady of rank. Whenever, in future, you should chance to fancy Mr. Rochester thinks well of you, take out these two pictures and compare them. Say, Mr. Rochester might probably win that noble lady's love, if he chose to strive for it. Is it likely he would waste a serious thought on this indigent and insignificant plebeian? I'll do it, I resolved, and having framed this determination, I grew calm and fell asleep. I kept my word. An hour or two sufficed to sketch my own portrait in crayons, and in less than a fortnight I had completed an ivory miniature of an imaginary Blanche Ingram. It looked a lovely face enough, 
and when compared with the real head and chalk, the contrast was as great as self-control could desire. I derived benefit from the task. It had kept my head and hands employed, and had given force and fixedness to the new impressions I wished to stamp indelibly on my heart. Ere long I had reason to congratulate myself on the course of wholesome discipline to which I had thus forced my feelings to submit. Thanks to it, I was able to meet subsequent occurrences with a decent calm, which, had they found me unprepared, I should probably have been unequal to maintain, even externally. End of chapter 16